Ever get that feeling, you know, when you're like scrolling through thousands of photos, trying to find that one specific shot, maybe your cat, you know, looking particularly majestic. Right. Or that um, amazing plate of nachos you demolished. And then bam. Yeah. Your phone search like pulls it up like it's pure magic. What's so fascinating is that behind that magic is this powerful technique. Um, it's called convolution. It's like the foundation of how computers are learning to see. And that's exactly what we're going to be diving into today, right? Yeah. We've got uh, excerpts from Deep Learning with PyTorch, step by step, specifically Chapter 5 on convolutions, ready to demystify this whole process. And it's not just about our phones recognizing cats, though, right? Mm. This is powering everything from medical diagnoses to those self-driving cars everyone's talking about. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It's huge. Okay, so let's unpack this whole convolution thing. Our source talks about filters. Is that like the computer... Um, looking for clues basically in an image exactly imagine like a detective with that classic magnifying glass okay yeah scanning a photograph for clues and those clues are patterns edges textures like the building blocks of understanding an image so instead of seeing the whole picture the computer uses these filters to focus on like smaller sections at a time right and that magnifying glass in this world we call it a kernel think of it as like a small grid of numbers, a matrix that does some calculations on each little piece of the image. Now, our source mentions an equation here, but the cool part is we don't have to write it, right? Right. The neural network, the computer's brain, learns those calculations itself. Exactly. That's the beauty of deep learning, right? We don't program the computer to recognize a cat. We create a system that learns those patterns on its own through training and data. This has already blown my mind. We're just getting started, but... Um... Here's a thought. If we're constantly shrinking the image down with each of these um, kernel scans, wouldn't we lose information around the edges? You're right on the money. If we keep shrinking the image with each convolution, those edges start to disappear and we lose important details. That's where padding comes in. Padding. Is that literally like adding a frame around a picture, like giving the detective more room to work? Precisely. It's like giving the image some breathing room so those edge details don't get chopped off. I love how visual this is. Our source talks about different padding types. Like, it's yeah. like choosing different like borders for your picture, essentially. Yeah, and each type has its own like benefits and drawbacks. The yeah. simplest one is zero padding, basically a frame of zeros. But you can also like reflect the image's edges, which can prevent some weird distortions, especially in complex images. So we've got our kernel, we've padded the image. What happens next? Well, now we've got all these clues from the convolutions, all these edges and patterns, but too much information can be overwhelming even for a computer. That's where pooling comes in. Pooling. It sounds so <laughs> relaxing, like we're at a digital pool party for our computer's brain. What's actually <laughs> happening here? Essentially, we're simplifying the information, right? Think about how your own brain works. You don't remember every detail you see. You focus on the important stuff. So we're like helping the neural network prioritize. Exactly. Our source uses max pooling as an example. Imagine looking at each section of the picture and picking the single most interesting detail. That's what max pooling does. Wow. So it's not just about finding features. It's about finding the most important features. That's really mimicking how our brains work. Okay, I think I'm ready for the next step. We've convolved, we've padded, we've pooled. How does the computer actually make the leap from pixels to, say, knowing it's looking at a cat? What's the aha moment here? This is where it gets really exciting. We've essentially extracted features from the image, those edges, textures, patterns that the convolutions and pooling highlighted. Yeah. The neural network now uses those features to learn. Hold on, let me get this straight. Mm -hmm. We've gone from a grid of pixels to like meaningful features the computer can understand. It's like we've given it a whole new language to work with. That's a great way to put it. And this breakthrough, right? Using extracted features. This is how things like handwriting recognition were cracked. Our source mentions Lynette 5, this model from way back in the 90s that used this technique. It's incredible how far this technology has come. But let's be real. The world isn't just black and white or even just cats, right? Right. What happens when there are multiple things to identify in an image? How does the network decide between, say, a cat, a dog, or even a steaming cup of coffee. Ah, you're getting into the realm of multi-class classification. And our source uses a surprisingly simple example to illustrate it. Lines. Lines. Wait a minute. How can simple lines help explain, like, such a complex concept? Think about it. A line can be tilted left, tilted right, or perfectly parallel. It's basic, 
but it elegantly demonstrates how a neural network can learn to differentiate between multiple possibilities based on subtle variations in features. Okay, now I'm really intrigued. How does the network actually make that decision? How does it look at a line or a photo full of cats and dogs and coffee cups and figure out what's what? That's where things get a bit more technical. It all comes down to probabilities and a couple of key tools, logits and softmax. And don't worry, we'll break those down so they make sense. So logits and softmax, right? These sound really technical, but they're actually elegant solutions for this whole figuring out what's in the image. Okay, I'm all ears, decode logits and softmax for me. Think of logits like scores, mm. right, for each possibility. Like, is it a cat? Is it a dog? Is it that cup of coffee? The higher the score, the more likely it is that the image matches that thing. And then softmax takes those scores, those logits, and turns them into probabilities. So it's like a ranking system based on those initial scores. Right. The line or the cat or the coffee cup with the highest probability wins. Yeah. It's like the, yeah. the network is placing its bets. Exactly. And what's really neat is that our source actually includes like code snippets to show how this works. It's less intimidating than it sounds, I promise. I'm always up for seeing how the code actually brings these concepts to life. It's one thing to talk about it, but another to actually see it in action. Absolutely. Now, while we're on the topic of how the network learns, our source also digs into something called the loss function. This is how the network figures out how far off its predictions are from reality. So it's like a feedback mechanism. Like uh -huh. if a network is super competent, it sees a cat, but it's actually a cup of coffee. The loss function is there to be like, nope, you messed up. You got it. Right. But it's more nuanced than just like right or wrong. The loss function gives the network like a measure of how much it's off, which helps it adjust those. Remember those detective tools we were talking about, those kernels to improve its predictions. It's amazing to me that we can quantify something as complex as like vision, break it down into math the computer can understand. It really is remarkable. Our source dives into a couple of different types of loss functions, but two are like especially important for image recognition, negative log likelihood loss or NLL loss and cross entropy loss. Those are definitely mouthfuls. What's the, like, what's the difference between those two? They both essentially measure how well the network's prediction um, lines up with the actual label of the image. Remember softmax, those probabilities we were just talking about? Yeah. These loss functions use those probabilities to see how confident, so to speak, the network is in its answer. So if the network is really sure it's a cat, but it's actually a coffee cup, the loss would be higher, kind of signaling to the network to like adjust its learning. Precisely. And the beauty of these functions is they don't just say like wrong or right, they provide a nuanced measure of how far off the network is, giving it like clear signals on how to improve. This is all starting to make sense, but what happens if we're training a network with a data set that's, say, mostly pictures of cats yeah. and very few pictures of coffee cups? Wouldn't that bias the network to favor, you know, felines? That's a really insightful question. You've hit on a crucial point about training data. If we're not careful, the network might become a specialist in one thing, like cats, and struggle when it encounters something it's seen less often, right? So how do we prevent our, uh, our computer vision prodigy from turning into a one-trick pony? Both NLL loss and cross-entropy loss have this really cool feature. We can actually assign different weights to the classes, so if we have fewer coffee cup pictures, we can give those images a higher weight. That's like saying, hey, pay extra attention to these coffee cup images. They're important. I love it. So we've trained our network. It understands the importance of balanced training data. It's ready to take on the world of image recognition, or at least our simplified line example. What's next? How do we know if it's actually good at its job? That's where evaluation comes in. We need to see how well our network performs on new images, ones it's never seen before. So beyond just saying like, hey, did you get that right? How do we actually measure the network's accuracy? One common metric, especially in image recognition, is simply accuracy. What percentage of images did the network classify correctly? Our source walks through how to calculate this, even providing those handy code examples we both love. Code examples make everything clearer. But we're talking about, like, potentially huge data sets here. How do we evaluate the network's performance efficiently? Our source highlights a neat tool called Loader Apply. Imagine you've trained your model on this massive data set, right? And it's divided into smaller, more manageable batches. Loader apply lets you apply a function, like calculating the accuracy, across 
all those batches without writing tons of repetitive code. Uh, so it's like a shortcut for handling those huge data sets. Exactly. It makes evaluating a model's performance much smoother and gives us a more comprehensive view of how well it's doing. And speaking of seeing the bigger picture, our source mentions something called uh, visualizing feature maps. This sounds familiar. Is that related to those hooks we talked about earlier, those like glimpses behind the scenes of the network's thought process? You're spot on. Visualizing feature maps is like taking those glimpses from the hooks and turning them into images we can actually analyze. Wait, hold on. So instead of just looking at like numbers in code, we can actually see visual representations of what the network is, like seeing at each layer. That's incredible. It really is. These visualizations can be incredibly insightful, revealing which parts of an image the network is focusing on, how it's transforming those features, and even why it might be making mistakes. Since we're not just evaluating the network's performance, we're getting a window into its brain, understanding how it's learning and making decisions. That's next level. And those insights are invaluable for improving the model, fine-tuning its parameters, and even designing entirely new architectures. It's kind of mind-blowing when you think about it, right? When we take something as intuitive as vision, like we just do it and we break it down into these like mathematical concepts, convolutions, feature maps, and we actually teach a computer to see, even if it's not exactly the same way we do. It really highlights the power of deep learning, doesn't it? It's like we're not just you know, programming computers with explicit instructions anymore. We're creating these systems that can learn and adapt on their own. Yeah, it's like we're not just teaching them to see, we're teaching them to, like, understand the world around them, just like we do. And that understanding has the potential to, like, revolutionize so many fields. Think about, like, healthcare. Image recognition is already being used to detect diseases, like, earlier and more accurately, potentially saving countless lives. Oh, absolutely, yeah or self-driving cars. That whole being able to recognize objects, understand their movement, navigate environments safely, it all goes back to these concepts. Exactly, the applications are vast. True. And they're constantly evolving. But you know, as this technology gets more powerful, I think it's also important to remember the ethical considerations too. Oh, for sure. It's not just about what we can do with this technology, but what we should do. Precisely. As we continue to kind of push the boundaries of what's possible with AI, I think we need to be mindful of its impact on society and make sure it's used responsibly. But uh, that's maybe a deep dive for another time. Agreed. For now, I think we've done a pretty thorough job of demystifying convolutions and really showcasing, you know, just how powerful they are. I'd say so. I hope our listeners are walking away with a newfound appreciation for that. Like, intricate dance of math and code that's powering the future of image recognition. Me too. So next time you're scrolling through those photos trying to find that perfect shot or even using an app that, you know, relies on image recognition, just take a moment to think about those convolutions, those feature maps, those kernels, all working behind the scenes to make it happen. It really is quite remarkable. It is. And with that, I think we've reached the end of our deep dive into this amazing world of convolutions and image recognition. Until next time. Until next time.